What up friends, Liron here and today we're gonna paint this. Hey friends, I hope you're all doing great. Um, today I want to paint this uh, little uh, barn house or something like this. It's just a small structure in the middle of nowhere. Um, I was actually trying to paint something else. I'll, I'm gonna put it here and it just didn't work or maybe I won't put it. You know what? Never mind. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I wasn't pleased with the result. I was tackling this scene um, for a few tries. I tried doing a value study and I then tried doing a color study and I just wasn't getting it. And the funny thing is it's simpler than the one I just showed you. But for some reason it just didn't work out so I decided to scrap that and just do something new. Did one value study of this one that just turned out really nicely um, and I decided to go for it. So uh, let's get started. So just before we begin the painting process, this is the small study I did for uh, uh, this scene and you can see here the barn is in the dead center, there are some trees around it, uh, the grass has uh, different layers and it's very interesting. Um, I then added some color, the color is not exactly what I will use for the final painting but just to demonstrate uh, the general pigments colors I'm going to use. Okay, so uh, we can get started with the drawing and painting process of this. So starting with the drawing here first, as always, I start with the horizon line. That's what I like to start with. Um, it divides the, the drawing into two main shapes and so it's uh, just a smart move many times. Um, in this specific uh, scene, it's about just about in the middle. Um, so I just located it and I placed it and now I'm trying to find the edges of the actual building. Okay, now to understand where it is, I look at the distances of the this uh, cabin or house uh, from the edges of the page, okay? Now for the bottom part of the cabin, uh, it's full of grass and the grass partially obstructs um, the bottom part of the of the cabin. Now uh, you can see the reference in the bottom left corner, but I will also add it uh, in the description box a link to the picture itself so you can save it and use it uh, in whichever way you want and uh, paint together with me. So now I'm looking at this, uh, the shape of that line of the top of the roof uh, and how it's diagonal compared to the top of the page. So it's at a very slight angle and now as you can see I'm figuring out where to end the roof. Okay, so it's the, these kinds of small uh, measurements that really help you um, understand where to place everything. You build it step by step. Here the angle as well. Angles can be a challenge. Um, <clears throat> you really need to disconnect from the actual object you see uh, and just look at the shapes and try to look at them in an abstract way. Uh, this really helps to create a better impression. Uh, if you can just look at what you what you see in an abstract manner um, usually you're able to to get a better uh, impression of that. Okay so just a little tip. Um, this side of the of the cabin is what's gonna make uh, what's gonna make the the highlights and the, because the light comes from the right and it's what's what's gonna give this really the sense of three dimensionality. Um, there is something I think I could have done better in terms of the roof and I will mention it later on. But for now, uh, we're still not in that part in terms of the of the painting. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we're and the the drawing process actually didn't take this long. Um, it was rather quick, I think about uh, nine minutes or so, something like that. Uh, so yeah, slowly building it up, started from right to left kind of, um, not, not pressuring myself uh, to get in too many details. Actually, I want to, to use as few details as possible. Uh, now you notice when I try to connect the roof to that line on the left, it doesn't work out the way I wanted. So I just move that line a little more to the left, as you'll see. I'm connecting a line to figure out where the edge is, and then I drop another line uh, parallel to the previous one, and I'm just ignoring that that previous line. Um, yeah. So anyway, I don't want to get in too much details. I want to let the paint do its job. Um, so the the thing with imagining an abstract shape is true also when you paint. Uh, if you look at, at it as a sort of dark and light shapes uh, that have no meaning to them, you have a hard, uh, an easier time to represent them. Okay, so now we have the window at the top, uh, trying to figure out at what point from the tip of the roof it, it starts 
and how how long it is in, in terms of where it ends uh, downwards. Um, so just uh, throwing in a line here that will help me place that uh, lower window. Uh, sometimes I find that uh, adding these kind of lines that conform with the perspective really help. Uh, this one is, is in a slight perspective, but it's so insignificant that, uh, to me at least, it's far better to just focus on drawing what I see and not necessarily draw all the guidelines that lead us to the perspective. I really don't need that in this case, okay? So, um, I believe we're almost somewhat halfway through the drawing process. Uh, from here on, it actually becomes easier because we have the the hardest part is just starting and placing those first uh, blocks. Now, once you have them, everything relates to them. So now the the details on the windows they just relate to the frame of the window. So you can see how it divides the window, how those little uh, wooden pieces that go diagonal um, that go horizontally and vertically. I have no idea what they are. They're called the panes, I guess, the window panes. Uh, how they uh, how, what they look like um, in comparison to the frame of the window and then you just get them in there. Uh, are, there are, are they in the dead center, maybe a bit to the right, a little to the left? Here because of the angle they uh, appear to be maybe leaning slightly towards uh, the left, the right, I'm, I'm really not sure, but it doesn't really matter, it's almost in the center. Uh, so anyway, I just know there, there are a few other details on the right side. Uh, we have the door, we have two windows, um, we have the texture of the roof that's very gentle, but still I wanted to get that in. Um, and one other thing that I uh, do include in the stage of drawing is I outline the shadows. So you see there's a sharp shadow in the very front of the of the cabin, of the house, and it, it comes from the roof. The roof actually casts it on the wall, on the wooden wall. And this shadow I will indicate right after I'll finish with uh, all of the details. So we have here the, this uh, additional door or window. Oh yeah, here I'm putting in that shadow that I told you about. Um, dropping it in there, it's somewhat parallel to the line of the roof. So it wasn't really that complex to put it in. Um, you just need to make sure that when, when it, uh, as it crosses the surface, it conforms to the shape of the surface. So if you have the window, the shadow is going to sink into that if the window is uh, embossed or uh, indented into the wall. But if the window is um, uh, protrudes or is embossed uh, above the wall, then the shadow will react accordingly. Okay. Now here's another cast shadow uh, from the right and then the door. Uh, in the middle, really um, sparse details, don't need too much uh, to get started here. Um, for this one, I was told on a previous painting that uh, I should try and preserve the highlights from the paper white, um, and I don't do that usually, I tend to get rid of almost always of the paper white, uh, because I find it's too, uh, it's too much of a striking contrast. But in this uh, painting, because the roof is so bright and the wall is so bright, uh, light, sorry, I just, I did end up using the white of the paper. You'll see this later on uh, in the painting process. Now, uh, this um, part of the, of, the, of the house is really um, um, uh, weathered and it's really uh, old and sort of destroyed. So the windows are crooked. I didn't get their exact shape here. Uh, because I felt like it wouldn't be clear enough that this part is weathered. Uh, I, I, a bit, just a bit, you can see here the, the right window is a bit skewed, uh, done again deliberately because it's weathered, but I didn't really imitate what I see in this case, uh, because I felt like people will look at it and just won't understand what it's supposed to convey. So many times you drop things that are non-beneficial to reading the, the painting. Now here I messed up just a bit with the perspective. The top line should be a little more diagonal. The top line of the of the of this door or window should be a little more diagonal like the roof. Uh, but that's okay. Um, I, I correct it later on actually uh, when I paint. So now we have the house in place. All we need to do is add uh, some of the trees so that we know somewhat uh, uh, more accurately where to place them. Uh, a lot of people don't really even put an indication for them, but I feel like I need it. Uh, some people just do a bit of a squiggly, scribbly shape, but I need a little more than that just to know where to put them. So I actually uh, draw the trunks themselves. I want to be able to know exactly uh, where to place them, and then I can improvise a bit if I feel like it. Okay, uh, so we have the tree on the right. 
we have the tree or a sort of bush thing on the left going on and then uh, we also have the division in the actual ground because you can see there's a part of the grass that's not really grass it's yellow and then we have the part that's more green coming towards us so these are the things uh, you need to pay attention to the foreground here is relatively simple and I try not to mess around with it too much <laughs> like I sometimes tend to do and ruin uh, an entire painting just because of that uh, so I really tried not to do that uh, too much here because I really want to keep it uh, simple okay uh, so yeah just putting in some of the details of the tree here I'm not as accurate as on the right because the shape itself is less uh, distinct it's just a big mess with the leaves, with the branches. So I'm not even trying to imitate it uh, perfectly in this example. Uh, the division I told you about in the ground, putting in just a random line. You really want to try and, and do these lines randomly to, to make it look more organic and more natural. Uh, if you do these lines too, too straight or too perfect, uh, it really shows up and then it, it just hurts the, the natural look. Um, of the scene. This is really true with trees and with grass and with foliage in general um, and all of that kind of stuff. With the house you need to uh, be a little more <laughs> accurate of course and um, put the lines where they should be. Uh, now these lines help a bit with conveying the depth um, and the three-dimensionality of the roof. Uh, it's sort of tiles that compose it I guess and they're a bit, uh, uh, um, I forgot the word for it, corroded um, so there's a bit of red on them, I, I suppose. Uh, I will use a beautiful uh, burnt sienna for that red uh, later on. So I did want to put some indication so that I know uh, where to put that uh, coming up next when I continue uh, with the painting. Okay, and just putting in the chimney. Uh, it has a part that's a little larger at the top. Uh, the chimney itself is thinner. So you want to pay attention to all of those things just to make sure you get a good uh, impression of what you're looking at. Really things that uh, you get better at with time. There's a lot of diagonal lines. can be a bit of a confusing shape, uh, but with practice and experience you get these right. Uh, just straight, strengthening some lines and we're done with the drawing basically. Next up we begin with the painting and uh, I'm using a very simple uh, palette. Uh, some of you have been following uh, the, the posts on uh, Instagram and also the time-lapse video uh, saw this. I'm basically using uh, Ultramarine Finest, um, Chromium Yellow uh, Hue, Chromium uh, Yellow Hue Deep and uh, Burnt Sienna as, as a, this uh, funny primary combination. This time I'm not using yellow ochre. Uh, so this is just pure uh, pure ultramarine. This has nothing else in it. I didn't try to dim it or mute it. I just use it um, uh, very pure. But the one thing is I tried this time deliberately to make my wash, uh, not deliberately, but rather as a reaction to what I always make. Is I have a common mistake of making the sky too dark. So uh, with this one I really wanted to make sure it doesn't happen. And so what you see is the result of that. It's a wash that's a little lighter than what I usually do. Now notice the left section there and there's a strong bead. All the water dropped down, the, the, it's at an angle and because of the bead that part doesn't dry up. So I made sure to load it with enough water so that it can hold itself, hold the edge and, and not dry out on me because once it's dry you can't really work on it. And now I'm continuing. You can see a small mark over there because I know it's not perfect um, and the paint did uh, <laughs> sort of was left there hanging for a while uh, but overall speaking I'm really pleased with this wash it's very simple um, not trying to complicate things too much because the sky area is not that big in this uh, in this specific painting so there's no need to try and cram in clouds and too many uh, odd details so initially I negative painted around the branches but then I decided to cover them because uh, it wasn't such a strong highlight so uh, I did decide to whoop cover it all okay um, and this is basically it for that uh, initial sky wash really simple really easy So next up we have a very interesting part, which is the, the ground, the grass, uh, this field, or uh, rather just, uh, yeah, it's not really a field, uh, but in any case, I'm mixing a green by uh, combining the uh, ultramarine, finest, and the chromium yellow. 
Um, and this allows to me to create a darker green than with the yellow ochre. Uh, for some reason the chromium yellow does that, but still not as dark. Uh, but that's fine if you really want to produce dark greens. Sometimes you just have to layer them, layer them on a few laser layers or glaze, whatever you want to call it, um, and and that helps you get the effect you want. Uh, so anyway, starting here with the top right area, putting in some green uh, because that's more in the distance. And when I go down, I will basically have to change into yellow. But if you look at the original reference in full size, you will see there is a bit of green just under the house. So I'm putting indications of that in. And my plan is sometimes, now this is something I like to do occasionally and I get it really nicely usually. Um, so I'll put just some of the green like you saw here and at some places. And then I'll move on to a different color and I'll just put that color in between the spaces. And I find that this is a really good way to vary the wash as well. So if you don't want to start on the right with the green, then add some more yellow, then go back to green, then go back. You don't want to do that. You can sometimes place uh, one color and then fill in the gaps uh, between it with another color. Okay, so this is really what worked for me. You just have to make sure that that first wash is wet enough, that first color you put is wet enough to, to sort of wait and hang on to the second one to come. Okay, so this is something you want to make sure. Now I'm mixing green again because that top left area should be green and you have to be quick about it so that the top of the yellow part doesn't dry and they mix together nicely. Like you see here, I was able to get that good wash. And while I'm doing that, I'm thinking of the bottom because the bottom should also, uh, you should also be quick about it. The bottom starts to dry up and I didn't really load it with a lot of uh, water. Okay, so uh, mixing, mixing a lot of green uh, and quickly covering that area, um, letting it blend a bit into the yellow uh, because I find uh, that it helps to, to make it just to blend better. Uh, sometimes you don't want the colors to just meet somewhere, you actually want them to blend together uh, and, and just to make a more organic and, and warm and nice feeling in this case. So uh, this is why I did that. Now the bottom of the wash is really uh, not that wet. So I need to be quick here. And what you saw me just do is take pure burnt sienna and just stick it in the, in the wash directly um, from the palette uh, just to create some interest, some texture, okay? And our, I'm almost done with the wash, but something I've seen a lot of people do that I like is sometimes um, they spray some water, some uh, clear water usually. I use the, the actual water for my cup. Uh, to, to throw it onto the painting, flick it onto the painting uh, with my fingers uh, just to get some initial texture there. Okay, this is something you'll see me repeating later on if you've seen the time lapse you are also aware of it. Uh, just a nice effect. You can also load the brush with water and just pull lines that will imitate grass if you prefer that. But yeah, it's just a really nice way to add that initial uh, texture to make it a little more interesting. Um, if you come into a already dry wash with a wet brush, you will have that very same effect with maybe a little more control over the shape. Uh, so now comes a really cool part, which is the, the first wash of the cabin. Now, the mixture I have here, and I cut out some of the mixing because it's just honestly super boring at times, and you just see me do the same thing over and over, but it is important not to confuse me cutting it out uh, with it being non-important, okay? It's one of the most important stages of the painting because it determines what you're going to put on the paper. Okay, so the the, um, the combination I have here, some of you, I'm sure a lot of you could guess, it's the ultramarine and the burnt sienna that cancel themselves out, leading to this gray. Now, it's not a perfect gray. It uh, leans more towards the warm, so the burnt sienna is a little more dominant in that uh, specific mixture. Uh, and later on, you'll see when I move to the wall on the right, I actually change it and make the blue more uh, dominant. And it's just to make some interest. Uh, a lot of people vary a wash much more frequently than I do, from what I see. So they will now switch to bl more blue. Then at the bottom, they'll switch to burn sienna a little more. I find that it ruins the quality of my washes. Um, maybe because sometimes it's too much color. Sometimes it's just hard for me because maybe I'm still not skilled enough to, to keep a large wash going while varying it. Um, so this is something I definitely want to work on. Um, yeah, 
<coughs> another important note that uh, a lot of artists, watercolorists, repeat, and I'm going to repeat here as well. I know it looks super dark. Uh, it's going to dry up much lighter than that. Okay, so uh, just like the grass, by the way, look at it now. Look at the, the yellow part and the green part. They looked so much darker. And, and it's just because there's so much water in them when they're wet. But once the water is uh, out, uh, once it evaporates or it's soaked onto the paper, uh, you just get a much lighter color. Now notice how the shadow here on the right uh, it connects immediately to the to the sorry the left wall connects to the shadow under the right uh, wall. So I just made that connection now uh, to make sure it looks even and it looks good. Uh, if you don't make that connection now, it may look a little uh, broken off uh, later on. So you just want to make sure you you connect as many washes as possible. By the way, just generally speaking. Any wash you can connect and make the look more fluid uh, is better. Unless you're aiming for specifically a fragmented look, which can work sometimes. Um, or if you're doing things uh, a la prima, what you'd call, that you just try and do it in one wash. Uh, which I find super difficult sometimes. I just can't get things to be dark enough. But anyway, as long as that's not the case, this is what you want to you wanna make sure you're doing. So now I'm sort of negative painting between the grass blades. I'm not really trying to make it too detailed or accurate. Uh, simply because it's not that, <laughs> that easy. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Um, this will help to bring out the grass because you see it's much lighter than the, the, house, the house's wall. Okay, this is why it's so important to, to get that darkness all the way uh, to the bottom. Now I'm just picking up some of the excess paint. Now continuing, I'm mixing uh, what I told you, a little bluer, uh, more, uh, a mixture that's more dominated by blue. Um, and here I did break off the wash somewhat. You can see it's not connected to that uh, wall. Uh, but that's okay because I'll just get them to look similar and because of the changes in the angle it will actually still read well. So you can break off the washes, you just need to know uh, where to do it. Just talking about it makes me realize how many different individual skills there are into uh, watercolor painting and, and uh, for that matter basically any type of creation, if, even if you're just uh, drawing or if you do any kind of other painting or any type of other art, there's so many little things <laughs> that you need to make sure you're doing properly. It's like they say the devil's in the details and the result is an accumulation of you. Uh, I didn't say that word right. A accumulation of you doing all those small things correctly. Now, and if you mess up a few of them, it will affect the result. It's not a disaster, but it will affect it. And, and true genius really, I think, reflects when you get all those details done. Anyway, I didn't talk too much about the negative painting here, but I do a lot of uh, negative painting around the windows because I do want to leave those highlights that I told you about. Completely white. All of this right wall I left white. You can see it's significantly lighter in the reference. I may have exaggerated it just a tiny bit. Uh, but it's okay. It won't be too much. It won't feel uh, tacky. It will. I think it will look good. Now you can see I have a puddle of paint down there, and it's kind of stuck between the door and the window. So I, I will try to make use of it. You will see me soon picking up some of that paint, bringing it above the window, <laughs> trying to play around with it. Uh, sometimes I do that. Sometimes I just continue the wash and then dry it off with a brush that's been uh, dried. Um, and continuing here, the highlights aren't really, I'm not really following exactly the reference in terms of the highlights. I may have left a lot of highlights that actually aren't there, uh, but that's okay. I, at this point, I, I just figured while doing it that if I try to follow the, um, the reference religiously, I just won't be able to because it's so complex. These little shadows uh, and highlights around the windows are just so complicated and you have the panes and you have some reflections and I just didn't want to get into it. So I just used my intuition to figure out what I think should be darkened. Uh, okay, so this is, um, this is just what I did here. Um, and again, negative painting around the bottom where the grass is. Um, there is, a, again, a bit of green just under the, the house and more towards us is the yellow and then uh, green again. And that basically finishes uh, this wash. I just need to take off some of the excess paint here. Uh, I think one of the... Soon it will come, the, one of the best parts. Uh, we only have just a bit of the wash of the 
initial wash to finish here and I just jump straight into relatively dry brush uh, strokes on the roof just to get that little rust action going on there. Um, I'm using Burnt Sienna Pure and I think this is what made this painting uh, relatively a success in my opinion because the the colors are pure, they're not over mixed and this is something I'm just now learning really how to do. I, I thought I'm working on it for the longest time but I didn't see significant improvement and now I realize just better how to do it um, and I find that it improves uh, it a lot. Now you could wait with this stage of the dry brush because it's really uh, something that usually comes uh, later on but I just decided to do it now because it made sense to me. Um, by the way, just talking about this color, the Burnt Sienna, if you want to keep things pure uh, red-ish, don't put under them a layer of blue because it will ruin the vibrancy of the red. Okay, this is just something quick I picked up uh, with time. Now, I want to give you an additional look at the reference here. Um, so I included it and now comes my favorite part and this is why I also wanted you to see the reference. Uh, because here we're going to make this thing three-dimensional, finally. Uh, the initial wash is usually tends to be flat, there's not a lot of depth to it, and um, just now on the second wash you can actually put in the shadows and really bring things forward and send things backwards. Okay, so this is what I'm doing now. I'm putting in a dark mixture. It's the very same Burnt Sienna plus uh, French Ultramarine, only this time the blue is much more dominant. Um, sorry, it's not French Ultramarine, it's just Ultramarine finest. Uh, all the paints, by the way, are Schmincke, I didn't mention it. Um, so, yeah, uh, this time the blue is a little more dominant in the mixture, and this is something I started doing recently. Um, I, I'm experimenting with glazing uh, blues over reds, reds over blues. So, for example, if this wall would uh, if I would initially make this wall more red using the burnt sienna, I would, uh, I, which I did, sorry, I use a uh, stronger blue mixture. If I would do the other way around, if the wall was initially more uh, dominant by blue, I would make this second wash a little more red, a little more warm, because I just find it looks good. Now, as I'm uh, placing down those shadows, um, it looks good, by the way, especially if you can still see the layer underneath okay this time it's really it's just a, a punch of darkness <laughs> really you can't see too much uh, but yeah so as I'm putting in those shadows I'm not just putting in the actual cast shadow of the roof I'm actually putting in all the darks so I'm uh, painting the window panes uh, because they're a really dark part that's important to include here uh, window panes tend to be uh, really dark unless light is directly reflected on them in, in which case they just, just become uh, really light or they may have a highlight on them uh, but in this case this is definitely not what's going on here you can see all of the windows almost are very dark now here I was tempted to try and sort of create a texture uh, of the cabin using the wash and then I decided not to entertain that idea too much uh, because um, it's something that's better done later on with dry brush and, and I have an experience in in messing things up when I try to put in too many details like that uh, because it's basically again not hinting them it's just boldly stating them look there are lines here which is just a, a wrong way to approach this you don't want to say you don't want to say it blatantly you want to convey it and express it using your painting okay uh, so yeah now I'm filling in those panes uh, uh, it's a bit hard maybe to see in the small image that there are actually four uh, glass panes um, so if you're having a hard time again uh, check out the link in the description box you'll find the original uh, reference it's from uh, Pixabay I don't talk about it too much but most of my reference images are from pixabay.com uh, which is just a, a good place to find images that have no copyright thing with them you can use them uh, basically to make money. You can, you, I could technically sell this painting, there's no problem with that. Um, so I always, just to be on the safe side, even if, though I'm not really planning on selling it, I still use the images from there because, you know, just in terms of the rights to use the image right now in the video. Uh, so anyway, pixabay.com, a great source for um, royalty-free, copyright-free images. You can use them for whatever you want for the most part. Uh, so check it out if you're looking for more references. 
Um, anyway, yeah, put this super dark door there on the right, and if you look closely at the reference again, you will see that there is this dark part close to the grass, just uh, at the bottom of the walls. So this is what I got here. Um, now I'm tr trying to figure out if I should put uh, more, if I should darken the panes further, if I should indicate some shadows, uh, additional to just how dark the panes are. And really, this is something you need to sometimes decide on the spot. Okay, so I just sort of uh, spontaneously decided to do that here. Um, so right now, I'm continuing with this dark wash, uh, moving in from left to right. Uh, the next part we want to get is uh, the, the right wall and all of the shadow under the roof. Um, we have a very strong shadow, and what happens is it's at a weird angle, so the shadow almost curves across the wall. I don't know if it's the, the the roof that's crooked or the wall itself that's crooked, but that's what you see also in the reference image. Um, and again, we're just painting shapes. I'm not really trying to uh, read too much into what is the object I'm painting. I'm just trying to see this as abstract shapes. Uh, <laughs> trust me, this tip will save you. Uh, there have been so many times where I just try to like boldly state what I'm showing and then it just never turns out the way I want. So uh, yeah, you just have to hint at some things, you can't really say them. Uh, so anyway, yeah, finishing up with the shadow, I got a bit of a wavy line there at the top which annoys me a bit, but I decided to forgive myself for that because the, the entire house is a bit crooked and abandoned and uh, weathered, weathered down. So anyway, now what I'm doing is putting in the shadows coming from the trees, which is funny because I still didn't draw the trees on the right, uh, but the shadows are there, trust me on this one, so I just decided to start placing them in. Uh, it just felt right, so I, I started to put them in. Um, and it really doesn't mean much now, but once we get that uh, tree here on the right, uh, you will uh, get a better understanding of why it looks the way it looks. Uh, so we have some shadows uh, under the windows, and again, because light comes from the right, we also have shadows on the left side of anything that's beveled out of the of the uh, wall. So because the window frame is uh, protrudes outside of the wall and the door also, so we have a shadow on their left side. Again, things you just learn with time and with careful uh, observation. There are a few details there inside the shadow that I wanted to put in. Um, these weird small hatches or windows or cracks in the wood. Uh, so I just placed them in. They don't really take too much uh, of the attention and uh, it just felt right uh, to, to place them in there. So now I'm mixing a very, very uh, dark mixture because the, the window panes again are very dark. And here the contrast is even more stark than it is on the left side. So um, just a really good uh, way to bring a strong contrast. And I know I may have overdone it uh, in the rightmost window. There's just the entire frame is lighter, uh, which is not the case in the reference. Uh, this is one thing I, I think I overstated, and it was just by accident. So. Uh, yeah, now some details of the woods. You know what, actually, now that I think about it, yeah, I did overstate those windows to the two of them. The door's okay, but uh, the windows are done way too much. So uh, this is just um, another lesson for me for the next time. Um, really, when you do these kind of videos, you get to see things differently. And I'm recording, actually, this narration a day after making the painting, or even two days, I think. Um, and things are now uh, far away from me, so I can see them more objectively. Um, so anyway, yeah, just try to straighten out that uh, bottom part of the roof. Um, and again, some shadows on the lower parts of the wall, just like we did on the left part of the house. Um, so now I'm taking a wash that's somewhat uh, lighter, and I'm just putting, uh, yeah, I'm just, just making some of the overemphasized windows disappear that, that I told you about a second ago. So. Um, because I did feel it was too strong, and also I have some tree branch shadows crossing over them. Uh, I just found that like the the right thing to do uh, at this stage. And I'm using that very same uh, light mixture to put in that side part of the of the door or the window, the inner part of it, uh, because the inner part is uh, again in. Um, in a more shadowed area than the wall. The light doesn't hit it directly, okay? So this is why I, I put it in um, at this stage, okay? So um, just to make that, 
Yeah, and a little correction on the wall. It was a bit uh, wavy line, not straight enough. So now what I'm doing is I'm using a very uh, similar mixture, this time dominate, dominated by the blue, the ultramarine, and put those shadows of the tree branches on the roof because that's where they're, they will have uh, an even stronger influence. And you can see this in the reference too. It's, uh, it just has a, a strong impact on the roof. And once I put the tree in, it'll actually make more sense and hopefully read well uh, and you can immediately understand what it is you're looking at because it's really a challenge to convey sometimes. I mean, now what I'm doing is I'm using the side mixing area, the side of the mixing area to mix a very strong uh, mixture. Sometimes it's it's really hard to use an existing um, area because it has so much water in it. It's impossible to get that dry uh, strokes. So you need to find a new open area and just use almost only paint in it. Uh, and I'm just starting to place in those uh, trees. I actually was lucky with the time-lapse video that the music became dramatic as I started this dry brush stage. Uh, so that was good and impactful. I hope you enjoyed the music, uh, the classical music. And I just see that people like it, so I decided to continue with it. And honestly, it makes things a little easier for me because with classical music, uh, many pieces are very long. And so I don't need to think about using multiple songs when the time-lapse video is a little longer and things like this. So anyway, just putting in the branches very randomly here. You see there's just an overall texture of trees on the left. Um, and I don't even try to put them in, you know, every single branch uh, in a similar way to what I see on the, on the reference. I just place this mess of a shape. I could probably do it even more abstractly. Uh, more can I say abstractly I don't know <laughs> in a more abs abstract manner anyway now moving to the tree on the right using the lines I put in they really guide me um, that uh, that trunk on the right I could have put it more inside and then avoid having it being crossed out uh, by the tape but anyway yeah that's just a small mistake on my end uh, so just putting in uh, and you may notice I'm putting in a little more uh, branches than I actually see uh, it's really easy to overdo do it, um, so this is actually close to the point of when I have to stop with this uh, because you don't want to put in too many details, you don't want to distract the attention from the from the cabin itself, you want to keep things um, fairly, you, you want to just say the message you want to say and not try to overburden the viewer's eye with, uh, with too many details that don't really help. Um, in any case, yeah, there are a few small branches that uh, can be added and I'm going over some of the ones, the trunks I already put in there. Some are coming from above the roof. Uh, interestingly enough, I chose to ignore the tree behind the house. There's this, uh, you can see all the branches coming out of the roof. Uh, I just chose to ignore it because I don't think it will be that beneficial to the composition. So I just decided to not draw it at all, not paint it, nothing. Um, so hopefully now the shadows on the wall and on the roof start to make a little more sense um, because of the tree that's in there now. Um, and sometimes it does take time for a painting to be to build up. Um, I just felt I needed some darker shadows in that area. But anyway, sometimes it takes a while for a painting to, to build up and you really need to uh, have patience and, and believe that what you're going to do is, will work. And really just now I'm starting to understand that statement. Actually, Joseph Bookrich did it in, uh, in one of his videos that you have to believe in what you're going to put in there. And it's so true. Uh, I think what, what improves with my... Uh, my abilities right now is more than anything is actually the confidence. I just have more confidence. Uh, I don't even think my skills are improving at such a fast pace. It's more about just putting lines more confidently. So anyway, some shadows again on the wall. And these are really uh, some of the final shadows that the trees are going to cast. Um, on the building itself. We don't need more than that. Um, I think I accidentally dipped into the cerulean blue here, so I just added some more uh, ultramarine to to cancel it out. And now I'm putting in that uh, foreground that you see. Now the foreground is significantly darker than the this uh, yellow sort of, I don't know what it is, uh, uh, withered uh, grass maybe. Uh, it's much darker, maybe even more than it appears. I actually took this picture and turned it into black and white, and I even manipulated it a bit, which is something I will talk about uh, maybe in an upcoming video. 
Um, I did try and um, and play around with the contrast, play around with the, the different tones to, to make them uh, feel and understand how the, the, the shape of things, uh, the shapes of things are built. And I noticed that this part is significantly darker. And again, it's going to be a little less dark than it appears now because the water is going to dry. Uh, so when you're doing what I'm doing right now, you have to be really quick uh, because I'm just using a lot of individual strokes and I do want them to merge into one wash. I don't want them to be completely uh, isolated from each other. So when I come back now with uh, more yellow in it, uh, just to warm things up a little to make them interesting, um, I do want the strokes I previously placed to, to merge together with what I'm placing now. Okay, and in some places where it already dried, this doesn't happen and you lose that uh, evenness or or that uh, fluid uh, feeling of the water. So I added a bit more burnt sienna just to again warm it a little as it comes closer to us and frankly just to add some interest. Um, I think it complements actually the the red on the roof uh, which is something I didn't think about when making this but in retrospect I can see now how it may really help uh, pull this together. And now I'm just uh, spraying again flicking some more water into the wash because I want to preserve that effect from the previous wash and so it just builds up one on top of another. So even though I glazed over it with another layer, you can still see that effect from the previous one for me sprinkling the water on it. Um, but I did want it to, to, to have that effect also on this second layer. So now I don't want the whole foreground to be really uh, with individual strokes and then leave the the mid middle ground kind of uh, bare and, and yellow it seemed too strong of a contrast and also if you look at the reference it's not the case so i just add a bit of touches here and there of green some more brown some more yellow some just gray uh, grass blades just to make it a little more uh, interesting and to to show how this entire wheat like area is not just an even uh, yellow big lump of i don't know I don't know, <laughs> just to give it some more interest, I guess. Um, and this is really close to finish, actually. Um, all we have is just a few more small details uh, to put in there. Um, I'm just going on with the with the, the grass blade shapes. Um, just had to create a little more uh, wash, a little more uh, mixing just to get the one the color I wanted a little more towards the green, the dark green. Uh, placing it in there, placing those grass blades in there, and basically this is it for the foreground, it's done. Now once again I want you to get another look at the reference. Uh, the one thing that's left to do really is that chimney um, to get the left side of it a little darker because light comes from the right. So I'm just darkening it and also under that fat part of the chimney I'm also adding uh, a bit of uh, the darker burnt sienna as you'll soon see. So the chimney is basically just burnt sienna. There's nothing else in it, pure color uh, and I found that to be a good thing. I didn't want to mix it. Again, wanted to keep some things pure here. Uh, and with that actually uh, this painting is done. This is the finished uh, painting. All I have to do is sign it, take off the tape. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. So friends, this is it. I hope you enjoyed this long full process of painting. Here's the final result. Um, yep. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this one. I had a really good time painting this. I'm starting to feel like my abilities sharpen uh, much faster with time. Uh, it's a very interesting learning curve for me uh, recently. Uh, I find that painting outside really helps as well to just sharpen the senses, being able to better recognize different values, different colors, different compositions that work. Um, so overall I'm really pleased. Um, this is it. Uh, if you enjoyed this, let me know in a comment below. Uh, also don't forget to subscribe to my channel and follow me on Snapchat and Instagram. And I will see you again in another video tomorrow. Thank you.